how to deal with and when to deal with Titania with the knowledge that Titania is coming you might want to build a crew that that can put out some damage a lot of min three if you can get it um, because min three does add up I've lost Titania to, to concentrated min three damage Howdy friends, Craig here. We've got another Malifaux deep dive. This time we're for the Neverborn Master Titania. Uh, both these guests have some really interesting points to bring up. They talk about how potentially Titania might be one of the best masters for those of you starting Neverborn. In fact, one of them even makes the case that she might be the best beginner master for anybody starting Malifaux. They talk about her ability and the crew's ability to shift gears. I thought it was interesting um, to learn really how they try to maximize some of the tricks and mobility that's built into the keyword. We spent a lot of time talking about whether you should go after Titania and to try to take her off the table or if you just should leave her alone. There was a couple surprises for me in the second level play and counters segment. And lastly, we talk about some of our favorite uh, schemes and strats in the new Gaining Grounds Season 1 and maybe some that we miss from Gaining Ground Zero or even the base. Enjoy. Playing a tabletop strategy game allows you to unplug and test your skills against friends. Every week, Third Floor Wars delivers useful strategies, discussions, battle reports, and reviews to tabletop games like Malifaux. If you want to get better at the games you already play or discover the games other people are playing, you are in the right place. Craig and Ray welcome you to the third floor and the Tabletop Talk broadcast. Craig here on the third floor. Today we're going to do a deep dive into the Neverborn Master Titania and how the Fey Crook works in Malifaux 3rd Edition. My guests are Ambrose Ingram and Matthew Peterson. Now, you know Matthew from his great deep dive on Dreamer. Uh, that remains our most listened to episode uh, as of right now um, by about 300 listens. So, uh, Matt, uh, we definitely uh, got a good one out of you. Let's see if we can get another one. Um, he's a henchman out of uh, Portland, Oregon. Matt, welcome back to the third floor. Hey, Craig, I appreciate you having me back, and I'm looking forward to uh, talking more Neverborn with you. So uh, when we're recording this, it's uh, right at the beginning of April. Um, we've been on lockdown as a country. Uh, you guys in the Pacific Northwest have really um, kind of been on lockdown longer than we have here on the East Coast. Um, what are you doing, man? Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. We we have all been on lockdown, um, most of us working from home, or if you are essential, you are going to work. But I'm a person who is uh, working from home and, frankly, getting some painting done, uh, some modeling done, and, and playing some video games, honestly. Um, so much time at home, it's it's hard to find much else to do except walk your dog enough and cook and, you know, but it, plenty of free time to go around. So video games, uh, painting, modeling, stuff like that. Yeah. Now, uh, what video games have you been playing? Uh, Mortal Kombat 11 has been oh, geez. Okay. my game right now. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's competitive. Uh, it relies on skill and, and your understanding of the game and frame data, et cetera. It's, it, it's a great substitute for Malifaux at the time. Um, so it, it's fulfilling that role. <laughs> Very cool. So anybody who hasn't played the game yet, well, what is, what is the, the, the fighter they should try? Uh, well, I'm, I'm currently a Kano main, but I do appreciate some of the, uh, the characters that come from other, other fiction, like the Joker or the Terminator nice. or Spawn, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun that Mortal Kombat does that. Very cool. So uh, Ambrose is new to the show, um, and he's actually a relatively newcomer to Malifaux, but has a ton of gaming experience, including uh, being at, uh, a GM for uh, role-playing games. Uh, he regularly performs well in local events and uh, is very active on Vassal. Um, so Ambrose, welcome to the third floor. Thank you. I'm living the floor head dream to be here right now. <laughs> <laughs> so Ambrose, uh, you're going to get the standard question, which is uh, how did you uh, find tabletop gaming and how did you find Malifaux? I um I grew up reading fantasy and um, I kind of was trucking my way along towards role playing games from a really early age. Um, I played a little bit of I must have been like two thousand five two thousand six. Wizards of the Coast had a miniatures game. It was out of the booster boxes using rules similar to to D anD D, and I played that for a good year and a half. And since then, I haven't played 
miniature games or war games at all. Okay. And how did Malifaux get on the radar? I first heard about it through through the breach um, when a buddy of mine told me to check it out because it had cool mechanics, it had a cool world. Um, so I was uh, I was actually thinking about getting into Malifaux right around the time when Titania was released in um, second edition, and uh, money didn't work out, time didn't work out. So I kind of shifted gears, focused on role playing games again, and then. Um, after a recent move, I finally was, you know, had money, had time, looking for a new community of people. And um, when somebody mentioned Malifo, I was like, yes, that's what I want. I'm going to do that. <laughs> that's cool. So I I've, it took a, about a 20 year break from role playing games, but just started getting back into it. Um, but, uh, uh, on our YouTube channel, we've been putting up our uh, Edge of Empire games. Um, and uh, boy, I, I, I forgot how much I missed role playing games. I mean, I love, don't get me wrong, I love miniature games, I love board games, but f- for me, the pinnacle of gaming is RPGs. So I'm dying to know kind of what is your main system. I've played uh, DD 5th edition for endless hours, um, and I think that it is the perfect DD. Um, but at the more and more time I've spent playing role-playing games, the more I've enjoyed it for the narrative side, the more player driven mechanics. Um, I've heard really good things about edge of empire, um, because of that, with their, um, sort of the narrative dice that they yep. put into that. I really like, um, all of the powered by the apocalypse games are great. If you want to make a character and play that character and have the mechanics of the game, build that character story. Our nice. the apocalypse is where to go. Very, very cool. So um, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on Titania and the Fae crew, and uh, we're going to dig deep in, into how both of these gentlemen build, build their crews. Um, how do the crews play? How does the master play? What are some key tech pieces um, that the crew can bring in based on whatever the strategy or the scheme pool is? And we're even going to go into uh, how to uh, counter a Fae crew if you're going to go up against it. Um, so Matt, let's start with you. Let's uh, pretend that uh, the listeners have never heard of Titania, never played Titania, never played against her um can you give me an idea of um what kind of master is she yeah absolutely i surely can so what we have here is a very tanky and mobile master she is the queen after all so she should be well equipped to handle most things on her own Um, so she offers players a master that can kind of be the hero for them in a way um, due to the fact that she gives you a lot of versatility. She gives you in-game options with a level of resilience that allows you to react to what your opponent's doing. So you so you find yourself, uh, she's trying to be the focus, trying to absorb the damage to try to uh, free up the crew. Does that sound accurate? Yeah, she, she can be doing that. Um, she can also be killing uh, important pieces that allow the opponent's crew to function and operate due to her ability to get plus flips on her attack um, and and get through some of those peskier uh, defensive abilities that exist. Um, It's also has range. So, you know, having the ability to keep back and also target those pieces uh, gives you more opportunities to, you know, take a charge and and survive a charge because you have that distance between you. That makes sense. Uh, So Ambrose, uh, let's, let's talk about her offensive capabilities. So, so how is Titania whittling down the other crew? I mean, I think that the most the most important ability on her card is her Awakened Hunger attack, um, which Matt alluded to. It's um, it's a range eight, stat six versus defense. So you know, off the bat, it's accurate, consistent. Um, it ignores concealment, and as long as the target's in severe terrain, it's going to be on a positive. The damage trip, the damage track is uh, two, four, five, and then hands out injured. So what you're you're doing with that is when you pick a target, um, you're gonna get your positive flips. Your I, I rarely ever on a negative when I'm when I'm swinging with that, and um, you can push damage at, at one thing very consistently. And when you hit that moderate or that severe, it it hurts. Well, and and. Uh- her passing out that injured not only makes her job easier with three AP if she's able to get those three attacks, but also I would assume uh, potentially sets sets up the rest of the crew. Now, I would be curious though, Ambrose. Usually, when you see something that hands out injured, you're going to want to activate that early, right? Because you want that injured to be in place 
uh, for as much of that turn as possible. Ge generally speaking, we'll get deeper into it a little bit later, but generally speaking, do you find yourself activating her early in order to get out that injured or? I, I can. Um, and I think if, if the goal is to take out a key piece before it activates, which is something that Titania is great at, she can get there, she can put the damage on. Uh, there's a lot of games where I'm activating Titania first every round. Um, and, you know, it's Malifaux, things can change, and sometimes you need her to sit in the middle um, and and let some of her other abilities come into play. Um, not to derail from purely offense, but her uh, she's got Life Leech as well. So, you know, she's tough. If she sits in a bunch of models and, you know, you are playing that waiting game and activating her later, or charging in and then sitting there before the rest of this crew can, can activate, you're going to get a lot of chip damage from that life leech and, and um, it can put a lot of pressure on the life totals of your opponent's crew. So Matt, we, t we talk about the concealing terrain. So obviously we need to really kind of bring that mechanic in. So can we talk about uh, why she focuses on concealing? Yeah, let's talk about uh, her main mechanics, uh, the crew wide um, keyword wide abilities. Um, so the first one I, I want to bring up is abundant growth, which allows her to place underbrush markers after deployment. And underbrush markers are 50 millimeter concealing severe terrain. And these can be placed anywhere on the board, not in your deployment zone, but also must be placed two inches away from each other. So you basically have to create two inch gaps in between these markers on the table. Um, but these things are ignored by all FAG crew models that have the abundant growth keyword ability. Um, so they're, they're seeing through it. They're ignoring it for movement. It does not affect them, but it affects the opponent, um, gives them concealing, um, slows them down. It's, it's a way that the crew can minimize the ability of their opponent to maximize their actions. So with that, it goes back to the awakened hunger attack and how you're getting those plus flips on her attack. There are so many underbrush markers, one per Fey model in the crew placed at the start of the game. So that can be anywhere from I've, I've had five to seven to start the game. And they're not stationary either, right? Titania is the only model that can move them. Her bonus action uh, can move them three inches with a trigger to move another one three inches. And this goes off on a two. <laughs> so you really don't need much for that thing to go off. It is a throwaway card, um, but also... Uh, it, it takes a mask for that trigger. So getting to move two of these markers, um, which can result in a single point of damage if a model uh, is is um, hit by one of them during that movement. Now, um, I'd be curious, Ambrose, um, obviously those markers are, are uh, uh, some defensive tech for her, right? Because of the concealment um, is there, what else is keeping her alive? So how is she so tanky? Um, she is, uh, I mean, she's got 14 wounds, so it's a, it's a big pile to get through. Um, she's hard to wound and that's another ability that's featured across most of her keyword. Um, she has cruel disappointment, which is a three inch aura. Uh, whenever a severe is flipped, it gets knocked back down to a moderate damage. It's a big deal. Yep. It, it makes, you know, you're, your focus screws, they have to deal with hard to wound. They're not getting their severes off. Um, and then it's just, it's a bunch of hit points. And recently in the FAQ, they did rule that the red Joker goes down to a moderate only, not including the plus one. So it, it, it did get a little bit better. There was no contention there anymore. We know it does moderate damage only. Right. But, but, but plus one, right? So it does moderate plus one. No, it does not do the plus oh, one. Oh, it does. It oh. does moderate damage. Wow. That's so huge. We are okay. saving ourselves a, a pip here and a pip there when we do see the red joker in that. Order. Yeah. Well, and when you think about it too, when someone is going hunting for a master, um, a lot of times they're going to do that with that red joker in hand, right? With that idea that I'm going to, you know, focus, I'm going to really drill down and, and try to maximize my damage. And, and the, and the fact that, you know, that kind of defensive tack really, on a master can be um, a pretty discouraging for, for a hunting party like that. Uh, yeah, it, it definitely can be, uh, especially because she has the ranged attacks. She ignores severe terrain, so she can really put distance between herself and other models so you can calculate 
how much damage she is going to take from the few activations that are close enough to even hit her. And if you play smart, she's not, not going to be in position really to get, you know, to, to be killed, honestly. Yeah, and I would imagine positioning is a, is a big part of being successful with her, right? Immense. It's, I mean, I, th- I think that probably one of the most important thing, and it's, it's the positioning of your models, it's the positioning of your underbrush markers, um, the positioning of Titania. And it, with the underbrush markers, that starts before initiative, right? Before your opponent has a chance to do anything, you're trying to predict where the action's going to happen, where are these going to have an impact on the game. You don't want it off on your right flank doing nothing when you've spent points, you know, soul stones to, to hire a model in that's bringing that to the table. So I'd be curious, Ambrose, can you kind of give me a feel, and it doesn't have to be, you know, blow by blow, but give me a feel of what a turn one for Titania looks like. So how does she spend her three actions? Um, Titania herself, uh, on turn one, I'm probably waiting to see if the opponent gives me a nice, juicy target to jump on. Um, so I'm spending my pass tokens, I'm doing some some setup moves, that might be Rougarou, it might be germinating to bring more underbrush in, um, you know, do these little setup games until the opponent commits with something. Um, and her reach is huge. Uh, one thing we haven't mentioned yet is the trigger she has on germinate. Um, and, and germinate is her tactical action. It requires a five to go off and it creates a new underbrush marker within six inches of her. On a mask, you're then placing Titania into base contact with that marker. So this is an action, but you're going six inches plus the marker plus wherever Titania places. Um, and that, I think it's it's about a nine inch jump up, jump yeah. up the board. Um, those, are, those are places that are ignoring all sorts of terrain. That's getting her out of combat for free. Um, but on turn one, um, ideally that's giving me just that little bit of reach so that someone pushes forward just a little bit too far. I can germinate once and attack them twice. And I've had that just remove a model. Well, she's moved six too. So, I mean, even without that, she's, she's mobile as hell. She's got flight, she's got move six, but yeah, you throw that extra three, four inches she gets from that, from the jump, from that tactical. Um, and you can see that it's, I would imagine it's a relatively uh, good exchange, right? To give up an action for a, a phenomenal move. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's just so versatile. It gives you so yeah. many options as to where, where you end up with that. And a lot of times your opponent isn't expecting her to jump that far. So, Matt, I'd be curious. I mean, from what I'm hearing, um, and I got to be honest with you guys, I have not played. Um, I think I've played one game against Titania, and that was a little while ago. Um, so uh, this, I'm finding this very, very helpful uh, because um, I, can, I can already tell her popularity is, is rising. But I wonder, um, it sounds like she's a master where you have to learn to shift gears um, to say, you know, I'm going to set her up to do, you know, this, and then I'm going to shift gears and go defensive. I'm going to shift gears and go offense. Um, how hard is that to really determine, Matt, what, you know, which way you're going to go? Is that experience or... Well, I think it is experience, just like any game, but it, it, the, the crew is forgiving. I mean, everything having hard to wound, being kind of on the more resilient side for their point costs really gives you that that room to mess up or maybe mispo- misposition maybe one model here or there and take a charge you didn't mean to and, and, and have the resilience to stay through and see what your opponent's doing. So it is a reactive crew because it is tough. So you can put yourself in position, wait out your opponent, or strike them early and take their activations away, and then see them react to you. So you're absolutely right, and that that comes down to her hand management and and your ability to see what you have in your hand and how you're going to use that to start the turn, because her crew lacks card draw. Um, it's something that I want to talk about more once we get to advanced play, but I think that that is, is where you get better with Titania, is how you use a really a six-card control hand. So I'd be curious, uh, Matt, it, it, someone someone comes up to you and says, hey, I think Neverborn is awesome, I haven't played Malifaux yet. Would you recommend Titania as a first master, or do you think that there's a better first Neverborn master? No, I think Titania is the best first master you could probably play in the game. 
Um, I, I do wow. think that she, yes, ab- I, I will stand behind that. Um, I think that she does offer the bare basics of what Malifaux is about to the player without overwhelming them with too much finicky stuff. You know, there's a lot of finicky things in Malifaux that you have to get just right or set up just right. And Titania plays your positioning game, your use of your control hand game, and knowing when to attack and when to defend. It's about knowing where the fight's going to happen and setting yourself up, sticking to the plan, getting there and getting it done. So and I that think forgiving nature is good. The forgiving nature is fantastic, um, but it has spikes of aggression in it. And just knowing where and when to spike that aggression, when the timing is right, and then end up in a position where you're not vulnerable um, is key. It's not easy to play. I'm not saying that it's an easy crew to, to start out with. It definitely has its its hurdles because you don't hear about it a lot. Um, I, I, I think people maybe gloss over it. Um, and they don't give it the time on the table to, to see some of the shenanigans that can come out. And that's true of most fighter centric crews. So that that's OK. Um, I'm hoping to maybe break that a little bit today with a little bit more of the advanced stuff that Ambrose and I will be talking about. But, yes, she's a great first master for any faction, any player. Well, I think that gives us kind of a good look and feel for her um, and kind of where she fits. Um, let's take a quick break. When we get back from this break, what I want to talk about is really what do we build around her? So um, what do Ambrose and Matt do when they are sitting down and building a fake crew? What are some of the key models they bring in? What are some of their flex pieces? So we'll be right back. So I think it's interesting. Um, I would, I honestly did not expect um, these guys to to call out uh, Titania as, as a good beginner's master. Um, I think in two E, um, she really came off as a pretty complicated master to be successful with. Um, it's neat that the changes they made into third edition um, really kind of uh, appears to have changed that for them. So Ambrose, let's start with kind of the easy first hire in a fake crew, and that's obviously going to be the totem. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and this is, this is an interesting point coming off of the idea that she's a good starter crew. Because when I picked up the crew box and I, I read the Garar, um, you know, I saw defense four, I saw willpower four, I saw four health. Okay. Hard to wound, but that's, it's pretty easy. It's significant. People are going to be trying to kill it. Um, I struggled at size three. I kept getting shot off the board really early. Um, and on, on the back of the card, we've got a tactical action, which is Mold of the Other. Um, so you can pick a minion or enforcer that has killed uh, and replace the Garar with that named model, heal it three. Um, and so you get this little switcheroo of take your, take your seemingly useless totem and, um, and turn it into something that you've lost. Um, this helps with the resiliency, resiliency of this crew. Uh, you know, the idea that you can take a punch, make a mistake, get your chest piece back and put it back into the fight. Um, and so I think that the, the Garar helps, helps that idea and, and helps Titania be a good starter master. But when you really start playing it, you know, he's bringing another underbrush marker. He is significant. And anybody who's played Malifaux knows that having a significant totem is huge. Um, he's, he's actually a decent attacker. Um, he's got venomous strike with stat five. It's two, three, four damage plus poison. Um, so that's, that's solid for something yep. you're getting for free. Um, and then he's got a, a ranged attack with a one, three, four, also giving poison, also stat five. People aren't expecting it. If you keep your Garar around until later in the game, he can sneak in there. And, you know, if you hit that three moderate damage off your totem, it can it can really hurt someone. Um, so, yeah, I think that uh, it's it starts out as a safety net. Um, it lets you get those those pawns back um, and it becomes a, kind of a really <sighs> a mini problem solver almost it's, it's not taking on the problems that Titania can. Um, but if it sits on the back line and survives, it, it can help you score those last points you need to, to win the game. 
So I would imagine in, in your typical game, Ambrose, you're, you're, it's not seeing turn five because either it's gotten taken out by a smart opponent that doesn't want to see that replace happen or you've done the replace itself. Does that sound right? Um, F, I, yes, I, I'd say that more often than not, that's the case. Um, and the more I play it, um, the more value I see in, in leaving it around. I'd say the last probably 10 games I've played with her, She's actually probably had the Garar still on the table on five of those. So about if, if that trend continues, maybe half the time he's still alive. Wow, wow, that's big. Because I would think that you know you're kind of aiming to aiming for that replace, but you're seeing value in and and not doing that replace and keeping him around. A lot of times in turn five, the Garar is just in a better position to do something as is than sacrifice an action and give it to a knight. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. So, um, Ambrose, after you've taken your free totem, what is what is your first fame model that you hire? Definitely looking at knights. Um, they are her um, her anchor. Um, and as we we shift from Titania to the crew it's, itself, uh, this crew is sort of trying to be a foundation. They're trying to be a problem for the opponent. They're trying to be hard to deal with. Um, and so the knights really aren't, they're not beaters, they're, they're not scheme runners, they're just sitting there being tanky. Um, I guess tar pits, right? They're, they're tar pit models. Um, and so that comes out, their defense six, uh, so cost seven, defense six, also hard to wound, armor one, seven wounds. They, you know, if someone expects to put their beater into this knight, they're going to have to put more actions than they expect and to add insult to injury, they've got uh, parry. It's not built in, but um, you know, if you hit that ram on the defense, you're going to be flipping back for two, three, four, and that can just really ruin someone's day if they're not expecting it. Yeah, and, and how many do you normally hire? Um, I'm sure you flex it, but yeah, I I, I start with one. Um, maybe half the crews I'm running are going to have two knights in there. Okay. Um, the uh, as often as not, I'm putting a Ancient Pact on there as well. Oh, okay. Uh, well, for those not familiar with Ancient Pact. It's got the uh, Avoid Doom, so they're going to ignore Black Jokers, um, which is not super relevant for what the Knight's doing. Gives plus one initiative, which is good. You know, you're, there are those turns where you want to be going first with Tanya, and that helps you get there. Um, the big thing is it's minion only. And um, they are tough enough to actually put this upgrade on, stick it on a minion and be able to use that. Um, and, and they're getting nefarious pact. Uh, so that is at the end of their activation, draw a card. Um, as Matt already alluded to, it, we don't have a lot of card draw. And so having a knight, if that knight survives for two turns and gives you two cards, you can probably make good use of it. Well, and that, that, you know, helps pay for the, the extra two stones, but that's an investment. I mean, that suddenly becomes a nine stone minion. Uh, but luckily they're tough, which makes you feel, I would imagine, a little bit more comfortable throwing the, throwing the upgrade on there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're not, they're not just there to, to sort of soak, soak hits and take cards. Um, they have a decent attack. It's also stat seven. So it's, it's That's nice. Start, sorry, start set. <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> decent attack, uh, at stat six. That's um, nice. Two, three, four. Um, but they're probably biggest biggest thing that they bring to the crew is challenge oh that's huge yep um it, it's uh again stat six so it's going off pretty good pretty, pretty regularly and then until the end of the round that model that they challenge has to discard a card to target anything else it's not attack actions it's not enemy models if they target anything they have to discard a card to do it targeting well, with an action right right now one thing that can often be important when you have when you have a crew that does not have a lot of card draw, um, you know, that sucks. Um, card draw is really good in Malifaux. But if you can mitigate that by putting some hand pressure, um, which challenge can definitely do, um, that helps kind of even even the stakes um, so that you can. So you're in a situation where, you know, you might be struggling with your hand and the more your opponent's struggling with their hand, kind of the better off you are. Uh, Matt, um, how about you? Is, is Autumn Knights one of your first hires? Autumn Knights are definitely the first hire in this crew. Definitely one. And, and a lot of the times I do bring two. 
um, Ancient Pact. Uh, I think Ambrose and I are together on that as well. Uh, Nine Stones or not, that, that is an amazing model to hold that upgrade because it plays into what they do. Come get it. We want you to fight me. Um, and then they're getting a card and then making your opponent possibly discard cards as well with a bonus challenge action. So having two of those models maybe gang up a challenge on one of their beaters or even their master uh, can be devastating for a turn. Um, yeah. And, and that can really give you the card uh, advantage you need when you don't get the card draw that you normally get. So what's next? After after you've uh, bought one or two of the Autumn Knights, what are you picking up, Matt? For me, I am always hiring a Rogaroo. Um, and, and probably using it differently than, than most people. Um, I do realize that this is a defense four model that can go down very quickly. <laughs> it took me a few games, I would say maybe 10, to uh, have the epiphany to sit back with that model and use its roar on my own models uh, the first two, three turns of the game to give myself some positional advantage um, with slower models like Killjoy or Aislin or, or even Titania. Um, and then late game, that model with its deadly pursuit and movement six and a flay trigger uh, can really kind of come out of the woods and, and smack something for six damage and, and possibly win you a game, which they have done for me on, on assassinate dives multiple times. Um, so for me, it's it's about keeping that model safe early and then bringing it out late for the the big damage. Yeah, it screams finesse. I mean, when you're you, when you're paying eight. Uh, stones for a four defense model, um, you, you better know what you're doing with it. I mean, uh, granted, it does have nine health, but um, this is not a uh, uh, a model that you can just be frivolous with. No, You'll you pay cannot. for mistakes. You yeah. cannot. And, and and I have made those mistakes early, uh, thinking, oh, this this attack action needs to get out, and I need to get as many attacks with this model as I can. That's not the case at all. It it is a uh, a model that cleans up the scrap. It kind of comes in after Titania's wave has come through and maybe beats up a model that's that's on its last leg or, again, is kind of a uh, last-ditch effort to put big damage on an important model. Very cool. Ambrose, um, do you also um, have Rogue Roos in most of your crews? I'm, I'm hiring them less than, than Matt is, um, and I think that I tend to go versatile sooner than, than he does. Um, but... Uh, I agree completely with how Matt's playing them. Um, I, w- I want to also mention uh, their melee attack is uh, Ferocious Claws, which has a two-inch push built into it. It's not a trigger. It's in the effect of the attack. That's super rare. Um, and being able to just hit something and not relying on that trigger and reposition it uh, is is an amazing thing to have. And I think that, that Matt's right. You want to bring it in late. Uh, make sure that it's alive when you need things to be shifted to score points. Um, right. You could just hit once, push something away, get it at, get it out of scoring range or into scoring range or whatever you need, and 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 it's solid. Well, and and with with that roar and its ability to push opponents as well as friendly models, um, score, scoring in Malifaux is about where models are. And your your ability to activate a, a rogue late, I would imagine, both against an enemy or a friendly model, can be the difference between scoring or denying a point, which is good. So, uh, do you, is there any other part of your core crew, uh, Ambrose? I'd say I'm taking Ace Lynn, uh nine times out of ten. Um, I like to start building the crew with her in it, and then take her out if I have reason to. Okay, uh, but she's she's an eight cost uh, eight cost henchman with nine wounds, so she's already she's not going to fall apart. Um, she's hard to wound as well, and she has counter spell. Um, the big thing with her is that she has decay again, an eight inch attack, no projectile on there, um, stat six versus defense, and a built in crow, and. Um, this brings us to Into Thorns, which is another uh, cross keyword ability. Um, Titania has that on both of her attacks. The Knights have it. Uh, I believe the Ruru has it. Yeah, Ruru um, have it. Yep. Yeah. So Into Thorns uh, needs a crow. The target has to be within two inches of one of our underrush markers. But when that happens, it's adding a point of damage, and then you get to place the target into base contact with the underbrush. So we're getting that little spike of extra damage on there in addition to a place. Um, and that can be a really 
big distance. If they're just within two inches and you move it all the way to the other side yeah. of that marker, that's a drastic change of positioning for the opponent. Well, and then suddenly it's two blast, two blast, three blast attack becomes a mid three blast attack at yes. range without a projectile. And and you mentioned it, but it's worth emphasizing that built in crow is a big deal. Yep. The fact that that into thor- in, into thro- uh, into thorns <laughs> is gonna is gonna hit uh, every time. Uh, Aislinn, is that a key model for you as well, Matt? Uh, I would say seventy five percent of the time. So, it, like Ambrose says, she's usually starting in the crew. I mean, she is the henchman after all. Uh, but she she can be cut given the scheme pool. Um, I would say that that she as a eight stone henchman is our our better one of our better schemers. Um, she has on her decay a draw out secrets trigger to drop a scheme marker in base contact with the target, which we all know is very valuable. Um, scheme yep. markers in place of enemies and on their side of the table is big. And then she also has a bonus action to study. So, you know, corpses and scraps all of a sudden become valuable when she's around. Uh, she is slow, so she does need that Rogaru to help push her or a doppelganger maybe to lure her to get her to get maximum effect. You know, movement five on a two action henchman is, is just, it's, it's kind of weak. But if you learn how to use her, put her in the right spot, she can, she can really win the day. Yeah, and we're getting expensive, right? So now we've talked about two seven stone minions that you're considering, that you're also considering dropping another two <laughs> uh, upgrade on, and we're talking about an eight stone uh, Aislinn. Um, is there any other model that always makes it, or are, are we pretty much now getting to where you start to flex out, Matt? I, I I start to flex out at that point. You're absolutely right, and 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 really, her crew. Nine times out of ten are is seven models. You, you get seven models in Titania. If you need the stones, if you're bringing the stones, you need to get the triggers you need in game. The into thorns on Titania to spike her damage to a three five six, which you're going to want to do when you have a high, you know, thirteen a tome. And you're like, darn it, I need that crow. Um, it, it, you you need to spike high damage with her. You need stones. So yes, she is running with few models, but those models are tough. And if they're in the right spot, your opponent has a problem to deal with. So speaking of stones, Matt, well, how many stones are you typically bringing with her? I bring five to seven stones with Titan. Okay. That's my range. I like to have six, but I'll go on either side of that number, and that's that's bare minimum. So let's talk um, versatile or out of keyword. So is there any versatile models that are typical uh, that we see in her crew for you? For me, I am always looking at the doppelganger. Um, I think the doppelganger is the best versatile in Neverborn and should always be considered. It has a lot of scheming options. It, it's basically your quintessential Neverborn. You know, lures, manipulative. You know, can draw a card if it takes an action outside of its its activation, which is is possible. Um, and then uh, she can um, scheme in uh, has don't mind me, which which is huge. Um, and then outside of that, I think that the mysterious emissary really shines in the Titania crew. So, and I'd be curious to know if you agree with this, Matt, but um, I think that the doppelganger stock went up with gaining grounds one. I think that um, the abilities that she brings shine a little bit more in the new strats and schemes versus in, in uh, gaining ground zero or even the base base uh, uh, third edition. Do you agree? Well, this is something that, that we're having to stomach as Neverborn players transitioning from GG zero to GG one and seeing that the FAQ really punch us in the gut and, you know, with the changes to inhuman reflexes, um, stitched together wasn't a big deal. I think they're actually fine or even better. Oh, yeah. Than they well, were. I couldn't so, agree with you more. I'm glad you listened to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, with that, I think what, what I needed to realize it, it, my initial reaction was, you know, look what GG one is doing for Neverborn as a whole. And I think, yeah. That, the schemes and strats really play into what Neverborn wants to do as a faction, whereas GG Zero made it kind of tough on us. You know, I felt like we had some tough pickles to deal with and our crews just weren't able to hold up to some of the the pools that we were given. Where now I'm looking at these new schemes and strats going, we got it. You know, planted roots on models. That's something Ambrose and I use and talk about often is that there's so much on planted roots for these models to not be moved by opponent effects can't lure me can't place me can't do anything and in this new pool that that is really really good 
I, I agree. Uh, how about you, Ambrose? Are you bringing in the mysterious and doppelganger in on a, on a pretty regular basis? Um, I'd say I rarely bring in the doppelganger, but um, I've definitely done it. Um, and I, I'd say I, I want to bring it in if um, I want to double up on Titania's Awakened Hunger. Right. Um, I think that the lure is going to be useful. And so if I'm if I'm looking at the, the lure and I want a second Awakened Hunger happening, then doppelganger is in. So how, is, are there any out of keywords or versatiles that we that Matt didn't mention that you like? I like um, the emissary. Absolutely right. Um, for you know some of the reasons he he mentioned, planted roots is big. It's it's tough. It ignores the underbrush. It synergizes really well. Um, I I like the emissary a lot. The other two, um, hooded rider. Everybody knows hooded riders. Great. Um, but if I want if I want to get that movement bonus from the brew brew, but I want a tougher model that's affecting the game earlier in in maybe round two, round three, instead of round four, round five, then I'll upgrade my Ruguru to a Hooded Rider. Um, and I do that pretty often. I think it, it's, it's unimpeded. It's only attacking with a melee attack, so I'm not worrying about my underbrush. Um, and it's, it's fast. Uh, so I have someone who can keep up with Titania. So I have to ask Ambrose, I mean... <laughs> The every not a single model is under six stones that we've talked about so far. I, I, I want to know are there are there any small stone models you bring into a fake crew, or is it just all these these big models? I've uh, I think um, there was a game that I was playing and and Matt was the TO and he he walked around the table and he looked and I had Groot Slang, I had Hooded Rider and I had Emissary. He was like Jesus, what are you doing? <laughs> it was just monsters, right? Yeah. And, um, uh, I think that, you know, seven activations is, is the number. It's you have to cut corners to, to get any more than that. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it works out because the crew as a whole is trying to reduce the efficiency of the opponent's crew. Um, we don't have a lot of activations. None of our activations are cascading into more actions the way some really hyper efficient crews are. But we're making every single thing the opponent does just a little bit worse yep. and it will bring them down to the level of, of a seven active a seven model crew mm -hmm. and and then they have to spend cards to get through the hard to wound they have to spend cards to get through the concealment and uh it's kind of this just annoying little bit after little bit that adds up to uh you know you're doing more than the low model count seems like it, it should be able to do. So, Matt, this sounds to me like um, one of the many keywords out there where uh, staying in keyword is 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 going to be important um, or having some very key, even though, you know, the emissary is not in keyword, it's a versatile model that obviously synergizes. I mean, he's, he shares abilities with it. Um, is there room for a second master uh, ever with Titania or is, is there just never room or never uh, something you can justify? No, I, I think there's room, and, and I do think that Titania can run with a Neverborn All-Star crew and, and completely get away from the Fae uh, and, and run essentially on, on her own, um, create her own uh, markers that she needs to, to use to get her benefits from her attack, etc. She doesn't need to litter the field with them, but I do think that it's a good place to learn how to use her. Um, but in terms of answering your question of hiring a second master, I think Nekima is always a consideration and in, in Neverborn to hire. Uh, I've been on some tables where there's been a lot of buildings um, in a Reckoning game where it's like, pff, if I don't hire Nekima with Titania, then I'm, I'm crazy because you just have the mobility you need. You can spike models and just kill them really quick. So she is consideration, not not the way I necessarily want to play day to day, but in tournaments, I, I would consider it. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So, guys, let's take another break. And when we get back from this break, I want to talk about um, putting all of this into context. So we're going to talk about different strategies um, that these gentlemen like to bring the fake crews in. We'll talk about some schemes that um, the fake crew excels in. We'll also talk about some schemes that you shouldn't pick if you're going up against Titania. So we'll be right back.
Howdy friends, Craig here. Nothing makes Malifaux easier than having the right tools. Here at the third floor, we love all the licensed Malifaux goodies from Custom Meeple. Not only are they helping support this podcast, they sell custom-made weird licensed tokens and terrain. They sell it all. Crew boxes, terrain, markers, tokens, and even a 3 by 3 full Malifaux board. Custom Meeple sells a complete M3E token set covering every marker and token you need to play. Custom Meeple are the source for the official accessories for Malifaux. Everything is designed by hand and authorized by Weird Games. Check them out at custommeeple.com, that's with one M, or follow the link in the show notes. Up your Malifaux game and be sure to tell them Craig from the third floor sent you. If you use the promo code third floor friend, all one word, T H I R D F L O O R F R I E N D, you'll get a 5% discount and help support the podcast. It's valid on everything except retail products and play mats. So now that we got a feeling about um, really kind of how these guys build it, and boy, oh boy, um, talk about an expensive crew. Um, I'd be curious to know, you know, with, I mean, let's let's uh put put it the uh, elephant out um and talk about him she's competing against dreamer um who's a phenomenal neverborn master so i'd be really interested matt what strategies do you think titania could potentially be better than dreamer in well in that context i i do believe that we just have to talk about public enemies i mean that, that one's gonna allow dreamer to create more points for his opponent just by the nature of what he does and summoning new right. models to the field. So I, I, I will go there. Um, but there's also some things that Titania can do uh, with Killjoy in that strategy that will just deny your opponent a lot of points. Um, so being a 10 stone model Killjoy, um, he comes with an ability that gives out two different upgrades to friendly models in the crew most people don't think to put that on Titania, but it is something that you can do. Um, and it comes with an ability called Complete the Ritual, which is a tactical action. And it says, unbury a friendly killjoy in base contact with this model, then kill this model. The unburied model may activate immediately after this activation ends, even if it has already activated this turn. So if you're forcing killjoy early, like you should be, you know, making your opponent kill him, and having him basically in your back pocket late game with Titania, she can fly out of sight of your opponent and sack herself and bring Killjoy back up to run away into oblivion. And you're basically out six bounty points at that point late game. So Interesting. It, it's, it's a denial play. And considering how tough her crew is and how they wear you down, it, it's tough for your opponent to score points but easy for Titania to score points early. Very, very cool. And, and I like the fact that, that you, you have found a place where uh, dreamer may not be ideal. Um, but, and Titania has a spot. Uh, how about you, Ambrose? Is there another strategy you think she does well in? Uh, yeah. And, and just to jump off of public enemies real quick. First, uh, Killjoy has demise immortal soil. So he does not give up points when he dies as well he buries instead so just adding to that denial strategy in that one it's it's really good um i would actually put titania into corrupted play lines um that's my number one pick for her right now um i think uh the Rougarou with Deadly Pursuit on them with that two-inch push on their melee attack are really good both at scoring your points early you know they want to be sitting back and um, not being in the thick of it on turns one and two. So you have one or two of those, making sure you score your backline markers. Um, and then late in the game, they can run forward, catch up, and be very, very relevant with that two-inch push. Um, I think Titania gets overlooked here because she's a flying model, right? And the okay. um, says you can't place. Yeah. Um, but she doesn't need to do that. Um, she doesn't need to do the scoring. Um, she's going to be disrupting the opponent's crew the other the entire time. I'm going to try and get her into their half as soon as possible and just be a pain in the neck. And then my Rougarou are going to be scoring points. This is also one where I'm taking Emissary every time because Planted Roots plus a Lodestone, he's going to sit next to the marker. He's tough with, with good defense, good willpower, armor, hard to kill, 10 wounds. 
and he's move six. Um, yeah. He's, he's going to score those points for you. They have to deal with it. Yep. Um, and you have Titania to deal with as well. Um, we didn't talk about Waldgeists, but this is the perfect place for them. They're, they're mini emissaries. They also have that planted roots. Um, ambush means that they can uh, do the whole um, interact, ambush, interact to drop two markers. Their base is just big enough. They can get that into play. So we don't really have a scheme runner, but if it's in close quarters and, and you know, they're not breaking through, but maybe they're leaving your mark. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd be curious, Matt, um, cause I think Ambrose kind of teed it off nicely there. Um, you, you don't have, and this is something, um, I think Neverborn struggles with in general is you guys just don't have any just basic scheme runners. Um, uh, especially from a versatile standpoint. Um, and even, um, I don't know, you could argue most of the keywords don't really have a good one. So I'd be curious to know what scheme, uh, or maybe two schemes. What are the two schemes that you just love to see when you know you're bringing Titania? Well, kind of like in the dreamer episode, I think Neverborn because they don't have great scheme runners tend to stay away from mass scheme marker schemes. We like to interact with models. We like to kill them, or in Titania's case, we like to be in a position or know the position we want to be in. Right. So I'm going to start off with the schemes being uh, claim jump and leave your mark, with, with which both say to get to the center of the board. Yep. If we know where the fight's going to be, we know where to put our underbrush markers, and when we bring the force to bear of our seven models versus their crew, we're just tougher, we're going to outlast them, we're going to be able to put who, where we want to with our into thorn triggers challenge is just going to weigh down their better models, fighting models. They are engaged with not engaged with the Knights, etc. So in a perfect storm, you're having a scrum in the middle. Um, so those two schemes scream, um, Faye and, and Titania. Um, and, and just to jump on Killjoy more, since we didn't talk about him earlier, he's clutch in both of those schemes as well due to his Barry, unbury mechanic and the fact that you have to kill him or his upgrade bearers before he's been eliminated from the game. So it's interesting to me, Matt, that, you know, he was not brought up as part of your core crew, but when we're talking about the strategies and schemes where uh, the fake crew does really well, suddenly Killjoy is mentioned all the time. So, I mean, when are you not bringing Killjoy? Well, it, again, to talk about her versatility, she can really be played in, in a lot of different scenarios i would say most all of them you could squeeze her in is she the best probably not but if she's who you have in your bag uh you would feel comfortable playing her and and feel like you would have a chance to win um yes killjoy is is spoken about a lot because he's somebody that i've learned how to use uh later um he is definitely not easy to get the most out of i would say he's he's a finesse piece that also takes time um but when you have these sorts of schemes and strategies that just beg uh, the, the, his demise ability to come out to just deny your opponent, it, it, you can't not bring him. Um, but that's not to say he's brought every time. Sometimes he's just too sure. slow and he's too expensive for getting around the board the way you need to. But if you have a get in the center on two different schemes, he's coming. Yeah, and, we, and we've said it several times now that uh, you don't have a bunch of you know, frivolous stones to spend, right? This is an expensive crew to begin with and your decisions end up being big decisions. So Ambrose, um, I'm at a tournament and uh, my opponent declares Titania. I look at my pool. What are some schemes that I would be a fool to take? I think that uh, assassinate is a double-edged sword. Um, obviously Titania is really good at it. That's what she wants to do is jump on something and, and eliminate it. Um, so I like it when it's in the pool because it's a great option for, I mean, it's never born, right? We, we want to kill the big thing on the board. Uh, <laughs> and you guys are good at it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think sometimes it is right to take assassinate into Titania. Um, so maybe that's not answering your question. Um, and we can well, it's the obvious that. pick. So I mean, yeah, it, yeah. yeah I, th- I think that. Let's come back to assassinate when we talk about countering her outright. Um, But um, I think uh, some of those other ones that um, just require you to be in one location, her her into Thorns trigger is so good at at displacing you. Um, So claim jump. 
don't take the claim jump. If she if she doesn't just kill you, um, she's going to be able to push you off of that point. Um, she's going to be able to push you off of the center. Um, and she's, I mean, I think area denial is just her biggest strategy. On, honestly, it, there are times when I miss outflank because nothing gave me more joy than denying outflank to soulstone miners. Sure. <laughs> you go out there, you can come back, but I'm going to put you on every turn. More joy, more money. <laughs> How about you, man? What, what is something you'd love for your opponent to take? Uh, I, I'm with Ambrose on any of the positioning schemes. I think the positioning schemes are, are what you want your opponent to be taking because you have all the options to be moving them off. Now, your opponent takes the scheme marker schemes. We're going to have a little bit more of a problem. So anything that is dropping scheme markers, there is not a way in our, our keyword to take care of that other than walking and picking him up. Right. So, you know, if we're talking about schemes we don't want to see our opponent taking, it's it's stuff that drops a lot of scheme markers or taxes the limits of our seven model crew. Yeah. Yeah. Something that's gonna take something that's gonna take a lot of actions to counter, I would imagine, is a challenge. Yes. Absolutely. When I've been in the situation of of um running her in a less than ideal pool, um, I've taken AD to make up for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know that's a point where if you're running a full bag of Night Neverborn, there are other masters that are better in that pool. It's the time yeah. you can do it, but you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, not that Iggy's bottom of the barrel. He's a fantastic model. He just doesn't mesh quite as well with a lot of the other stuff that's out there. Right. Again, keeping in co- keeping it in context with the rest of the faction. Right. Yeah. I mean, and again, what this is what this harkens back to what we talked about in the previous segment. It's nice to hear for somebody new to Malifaux that they have a master that can compete in most pools. Um, so, you know, they can get started by buying maybe 10, 11 models, get them painted up and, and be out there playing and competing and not feeling that, um, you know, there's, let's be honest, there's some factions where if you're not running, if you're not bringing three masters to the tournament, you're going to have some problems because they, they don't have a good all comer um in, in the faction um it's interesting that titania may be that um for somebody which uh you know bolsters the point that you guys made which that uh she may be a great first master so guys let's take another break and when we get back from this break we're going to get to my favorite favorite segment of the pot of these deep dives which is talking about second level play and um what if what have matt and ambrose figured out now that they've gotten 10 games 20 games 30 40 50 games of titanium and and, and things that you're not going to see the first time you put her on the board. And we'll also figure out how we can potentially counter what is sounding to be a very powerful keyword. We'll be right back. Howdy friends, here on the third floor you'll find us playing Malifaux and other games on Mats by Mars. They are scratch-resistant, waterproof, wet erase marker compatible, and lighter than neoprene. These mats use a new material that almost eliminates any glare. Mats by Mars gives you over 40 designs to choose from. Pick a mat size, pick a design, then choose an overlay like the one for Marvel Crisis Protocol or Malifaux 3rd Edition strats and schemes. It's going to speed up your deployment and the placement of strategy and objective markers. Until the end of June 2020, you can use the new promo code THIRDFLOOR620 to get a 10% discount on your next order. In the notes, you can ask for the Third Floor Wars logo to be put on your mat for free. Again, use the promo code Third Floor 620 that's T-H-I-R-D-F-L-O-O-R-620, to get a 10% discount. All the details are in the show notes. So what I'm finding with uh, Malifaux Third Edition, even more than in Second Edition, is that... Um, uh, every keyword is multi-layered. Uh, every keyword has an obvious thing that it does, but the, when, when you get your reps in, you start realizing that there's uh, there's hidden strengths or even sometimes even hidden weaknesses that you have to watch out for in every keyword. So, Ambrose, let's let's talk about what you consider second level play. Things you figured out about this fake crew after you got in several games. Yeah, um, I'd say the the biggest level up that I had uh, was playing the Autumn Nights well. Um, and, and challenge in particular, it looks incredibly situational. Um, and I think that, um, I didn't, they didn't seem to have, you know, a a real strong purpose on the board and I was letting their activations fall later and later. And then of course, challenge, 
isn't doing anything. Um, and, uh, you know, I started in order to, to make that ability work, I started forcing myself to activate nights, either first or second or third, um, get them, even to put them out of position in order to get a challenge off on something valuable. And, um, you know, I started seeing results on that immediately. Um, and then you start doing stuff like challenge something, walk away, charge something else. Now you're, you know, the, the challenge has a eight inch range and they've got a five inch move. You can challenge something that's on one side of the board, go off to the other side of the board and tie something up. And, and now that night is effectively in two places at once. Well, um, challenge, challenge is one of those abilities. Uh, and there's a, there's several of them. And I've talked about them on the show before where when you're the player, right. And you've got a model like, the, like the night and you're dishing out those challenges at the end of the game, you feel like, well, you know, the night didn't really do anything. Right. You know, I threw the challenges out and nothing really happened. I didn't feel like I get out. What you don't realize is the decisions that the actions that weren't taken by your opponent because of that. You don't realize the the choices that were being made on the other side of the table. So sometimes it might feel like that model um, didn't do much. And then you ask your opponent and say, and the opponent goes, that night is the biggest pain in my ass. Mm -hmm. This whole game. You're like, oh, wow, I didn't even realize that. And it, it can shut down stuff. It can shut down heels. Um, it can shut down. I, I've got your backs. And, you know, I've been in games where I've put it on this support piece and that support piece has three different actions that they want to take on three different members of their own crew. Yeah. And now they have to discard a card every time they do it. And that hurts. You know, who, who wants to spend three cards just to move your little Gotroba core or whatever, right? Like, it feels bad. <laughs> it feels really bad. And I would imagine, Ambrose, figuring out where to place that challenge is a big deal. And you bring up a really good point, whereas I think the the instinct might be, you know, to, to the beater, you know, put it on the opponent's beater. But if you've got a support piece that's in range, that's going to be doing a lot of things targeting its own models, challenge can be just devastating. And that, that support piece is one that probably doesn't have a good ability to affect the knight. Right. right, you put it. You put it on the beater, and they're probably going to shrug and turn the beater around and attack the knight. And sometimes that's what you want because now that beater's not attacking Titania. Now that beater's not attacking your Rougarou. What? So that can absolutely be the right play. Um, but sometimes, you know, the the little thing can't punch back, and they still want to use those actions for something. Yeah, yeah, definitely. How about you, man? What are what are some things that you figured out after you got your reps in? Well, my main thing with Titania uh, is hand management. Uh, it's something you learn after uh, many games playing against Bayou or other more fortunate factions that are constantly drawing cards into their hand. Well, you, <laughs> by fortune, by fortune, you'd be broken. Right? <laughs> yeah. right. well, where you just sit there with uh, the six that you started with and, and maybe, you know, an ancient pact draw here or there. But it really doesn't feel like much. So right. really, the second level play comes into, you know, drawing that hand of cards looking at that hand of cards and knowing how I should act based on that. You know, you can't always be gung ho and attack and assume that your deck's going to give you good cards. It's, it's a, that's a silly way to play the game. That's, that's a fun way to play. And we're talking about winning games. So, you know, Titania's crew have enough moderate level abilities scattered about that are useful, that do things that require five, sixes and sevens. Juggernaut on, on Killjoy. Um, you know, the Bultungan, who's a five stone model who I'll hire one of, has condition removal. Um, so, so that might come into play versus certain masters who I'm expecting a lot of conditions to go out. It takes a seven. You know, it's, it's a moderate card. So, so knowing where to put those cards in your hand, um, stay away from models and, and elements that remove cards from your hand. And then um, using that hand to take out the important models that your opponent has. And that only ever comes with experience. If you don't know what to kill, you you know, you you could just be banging your head against a wall. Yeah. It's, it's hard not to cheat. Sometimes it's hard. It's hard. And when you're in a situation when you know, you have the card to stop whatever's coming, it's hard for you to have the discipline to say, this card is spoken for. Um, This card has a very specific purpose, something that's more important than what's happening right now. Uh, I'll quickly plug um, Ray's video and Ray's uh, podcast about hand management because um, it's one of the big things that Ray preaches. um, And it sounds like that's uh, crucial uh, here with the fake crew. 
it's it's crucial to playing the Fey crew and and knowing that how the hand and the and and the you know little access to card draw what 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 you get for that what you get for that is toughness models that can take a punch and then positioning elements that slow your your opponent down you know and that comes with the underbrush markers moving underbrush markers creating them so you know you are putting action pressure on your opponent whereas you don't have card advantage so that's where you're you're having that balancing act occur so kind of marrying those concepts on the table is is where you're going to be consistently good with Titania and that you know is is Cody Hyatt's control or I guess really the magic idea of yep. control aggressor you know and Titania's 50-50 in that every game yep. she's 50-50 so you have to decide that almost turn to turn too based on your hand so that that's the high level play right there and, and and having the flexibility to be able to do both makes you reactive, which is something I think that you guys have really been hammering home. So that idea of um, the, the the idea from Magic is who's the beat down. Um, and I think that Matt's right. Titania is sitting right on the middle line. If, if, if um, to, to continue the Magic the Gathering uh, metaphor, this is a, a mid range deck. You know, she's not aggro. She's not control. She doesn't really fit either of those. She has elements of both. And the point of that, who's the beat down idea is that you need to be constantly evaluating that status. Are you the beat down? Are you the control? Yep. Um, you now in magic, you're, you're racing to kill the opponent, right? The game ends when you hit zero life. We have a set number of turns. So I think the question is, if the game ends right now and all the models are in the position they're in, am I scoring a winning game or not? And if the answer is no, then I need to be the aggressor. Um, and that might not, it could mean killing models. It could mean shifting them. It could mean yeah. pulling them within to thorns. It could mean deleting something. Um, it could mean shoving underbrush in their face so they can't get to where they need to be. Um, but it, it means changing the status quo of, of the board state and then the inverse is true and if you're the control keep it static and i think a lot of the tools that titania has the fact that her models are so hard to shift the fact that she can so easily move other people's models she can delete key models um this goes back to what you said early that um she can kind of turn on a dime and yep. fit the role she needs to so if you're doing a good job of evaluating evaluating the state of the game at any given point in time and playing the role you're supposed to be playing, you should be winning just about every game of Malifaux that you're, you're running her in. So Matt, I mean, so we start off the podcast uh, talking about, you know, she's forgiving. Uh, she's a great first master. Um, but we could, we're talking now second level play, some pretty advanced stuff. So I'd be curious to know, especially as a henchman who's, you know, I would assume he's, has met more than a few new players and helped foster a new, you know, new players into the community. Are there any tips or tricks or shortcuts you can give? And let's focus on hand, hand management. Is there, th cause that's hand management is advanced stuff. Um, and, and I think it takes a lot to get good at that. Are there any tricks you can give, um, somebody who's new to Malifo that's listening to get better at hand management? Well, the, what I preach to new players is to pick a crew that you like thematically, that looks cool, and and learn it. Learn that one crew. Don't bounce around. And when, and then when you do that and you place your cards down after you play a game, you start to see the TN values. You start to see where suits can be allocated within your crew. Um, for example, Titania doesn't really use tomes outside of Aislinn. Or the emissary. So when I pop a tome in my hand, I think, okay, can the emissary or Aislinn use the, that this turn? No. Okay, that can be saved for something else. Um, so really looking at your triggers, your simple TNs, um, and where you, those maybe two or three suits can go, uh, just make that judgment call early in the turn whether you need that suit for that, that thing, that turn. Um, and then from there, looking at your high cards and, and, and what you can use those for, that's just a matter of just knowing your maths and understanding most things um, attack at one value higher than, than your opponent. Um, and then looking at, at triggers that you might need, you know, obviously if you're a henchman or a master, soul stones come into play there, but really think about your minions and your enforcers first. Think about where you can put those high suits for them, because then you're going to get max value out of your enforcer where your masters and henchmen's, 
you know, they, they, they can kind of suffer that for a turn or two when you have the opportunity to make your enforcer or minion count that turn. Well, and a big part of, and, you, and you're, you're, you're preaching my gospel as far as, you know, sticking to one crew and learning it like the back of your hand. Yeah. That's how you yep. get better at the game. 100%. Um, yeah, you, you, the phrase I use is you stop playing your crew and you start playing Malifaux at that point. Exactly. Um, and, and one of the things that I'm just going to, basically I'm just rephrasing what you said here, but I think it's a neat, a neat uh, way to think about it is once you know your crew, you get a sense of what are the nice-to-haves and what are the must-haves. And the must-haves are these are the key things this turn that need to happen. If I'm going to win this game, these one, two, or three things have to happen. So do I have the resources, the cards, whatever that resource is, the action economy, to make those must-haves happen. And then the nice-to-haves, if I flip it, if I top deck it, if it comes together, great. You know, that could be the that that could be fantastic. But being able to differentiate between the nice-to-haves and the must-haves on a turn-by-turn basis is a big deal. Couldn't agree with you more. Yep. That, and that's high level play. That is that is what yep. playing Malifaux is all about. Um, and then you uh, truncate that with having to pick schemes and what your crew's good at there. And it, it's just there's layer upon layer of how you get better at this game um, by like actually it. playing it with the core mechanics and not just relying on um, the broken stuff that exists. You know, like that. That's one thing I hope to, to be able to do is to promote real solid cerebral gameplay and not just going, Hey, I'm going to pick what's really solid or maybe that's over tuned and win all the time with it. And it just, it doesn't really add to your ability at that point. You're just relying on what we all call crutches. Um, yeah. And that's, that's not how I want to promote the game of Malifaux. So as a henchman, I want to teach people to play the game, not find its deficiencies. So I'm the worst, I'm the worst culprit talking about broken this broken that soulstone minor jokes here stitch together jokes there um but if you've played any number of tabletop games you know that um I, i'm making a bit of a mountain out of a molehill right <laughs> um because what's what's out of bounds and overtuned and broken in malifaux is balanced as all balanced compared to almost every other tabletop game out there so to build off of what you said matt yes someone can come in and they can get models that we think are really really good for their cost and quite frankly if they're not making good decisions if they don't know that crew they're going to lose the game yep um you can't there's no net listing in malifaux um uh, there was a little bit of a stir up. Um, I think it was, uh, my buddy Adam that's, uh, made a joke about people saying, what list did you bring? Um, and kind of poo pooing that. And, uh, Adam can be Adam. Um, but the point he was making, I think is a valid point, which is, you know, this isn't 40 K. Um, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't magic the gathering where you, you know, you, you find out what the, the 40 cards are, the 60 cards are. Um, it takes a lot more to get good at this game. Um, which is, I think, why we like it so much. So um, I think that gives us a good feel. Um, Ambrose, I want to talk about some weaknesses and counters. So if you, as a Titania player, what do you hate to see on the other side of the table, or what do you hate to see your opponent doing? Yeah, um, my favorite thing to hear at the start of the game is a flippant comment about, I'm going to ignore Titania because it's not worth it. <laughs> which has happened multiple times um, and she does have this reputation of being hard to kill and hard to take down and there's truth to that and and so you know I'm going to tell you that um, some the best thing to do is to deal with her um, but there is a right way to do that um, so in addition to her life leech that she's healing back she does have a ram trigger on her awakened hunger that heals her and pulls a condition off so the worst thing you can do is sink seven points of damage into her and let her activate again. Right. You need to you need to do you need to let her activate, and then you need to pile everything onto her and kill her. Yep. Um, if you've got the ability to stun her or the um, uh, I know you're going to do that uh, ability that like big big brain brain has. Yep. You know her get out of dodge ability that germinate place. That's a trigger. She can germinate all day long, but if she can't trigger it, she's stuck there and has to disengage like everybody else. Um, so, you know, if, if you have that ability to, to shut down the triggers, um, you're in a much better position to, you know, maybe draw out that pile in. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, if, if you're going to try and kill her, 
do it in one turn before she can activate again. Um, because otherwise, she's going to life leech here, she's going to life leech there, she's going to stone for ram and heal to pull the poison off of her, then she's going to get out of dodge and score me two points. There is no try. It's do or do not, right? Do or do not. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd be curious, though, uh, Ambrose, as far as target priority, out, let's, let's take Titania out of it. Let's talk about the rest of the crew. If I'm going up against a fake crew, who should I really look to get off the table? Who's a key? Who, what are key pieces that when you lose them on turn two, it's not good for a fake crew? Oh, man, that is a great question. It's um, a really great question. It's it's hard to answer, actually. Yeah, I, I think that if if you if I'm taking claim jump, obviously, if you can suss that out, um, but I'll put claim jump on a knight. I'll put I'll bring two knights, put ancient packs on both of them, and put claim jump on one of them, and make you play that shell game. Um, I, I think that the rest of her crew is so robust and they're all just kind of, like I said, they're kind of restricting your actions that it's, it's hard to, to jab a, a knife into a soft spot. Yeah. Uh, it's doable, but I think it really depends on what schemes I have taken. And so right. sometimes that, that weak point really, unless I show my hand, right. If I, you know, push Killjoy forward and put him on the center and he's my claim jump. But frankly, if I've done that, he's not my claim jumper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how about you, Matt? What are, what are some things that um, an opponent going up against Faye um, should really, should really look to do in order to be able to eke out a win? Well, I think the, the key thing that Ambrose brought up was uh, how to deal with and when to deal with Titania with the knowledge that Titania is coming. You might want to build a crew that, that can, put out some damage, a lot of min three, if you can get it, um, because min three does add up. I've lost to Tanya to, to concentrated min three damage. Uh, she is only uh, defense five, so yeah. she can she can be hit. Um, so you really need to g- come into crew building with either the idea, depending on the schemes and strats. So you, we are asking you do the same thing we're doing as to Tanya players and assess these things every step of the way. Um, can you kill her efficiently or, or, or do you uh, try to slow her down and play an outscore kind of a game? That, 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 that is what you are trying to decide based on the pool. Um, if you know she's going to be somewhere and you can bring the force to bear, go that way and take her out. And then you will have a much better time you know, winning that game because Titania's ability to fly off and score is, is paramount to her crew. Um, or the other way you can go is uh, use the amount of actions against the Fae. You know you're going to see a seven model crew. So if you can play the board and play the space game and not feel like you need to kill anything, you know, you're not even looking for a weak spot. You're looking to score. Um, yeah. You'll have a much better time because there's nothing desirable to kill except maybe a Rogaru. Um, but if you position those properly in the back, you know, to get to them is already a problem. Um, so you know, that's it. There's really little low hanging fruit in the crew. Well, it's, it's funny. Um, and, and you, you kind of, you kind of alluded to this, Matt is often when we think about weakest encounters, we tend to go, well, what should I hire? Right. What are my counter picks? What are my, what are my hard counters? Um, the reality is a lot of times your, um, your counters are going to be your selections, yeah. And what themes you choose. Um, and I think that uh, you did a good job of kind of emphasizing that um, it um, we can easily get lost in the trap of I need to build my I need to build against this crew. And then I'm just going to lo- end up losing the game because I picked the wrong schemes. Um, and, and knowing that the way that you it's it's imp- it, and this is against anybody, not just gets against the team. Understand what they do well. And make sure that you're looking at that pool and saying, what are things that I can do effectively? And this keyword I'm going up against is not good at countering. And it's why I think it's crucial that you listen to 
not just the deep dives on you, the masters you play, but listen to as many deep dives as you can, because I mean, this is a warm horse, but meta knowledge matters and, and understanding what these keywords are good at and what they're good at countering can be uh, very important. Guys, we're going to take one more break. When we get back from this break, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that this is one of the first recordings we've gotten um, since uh, Gaining Ground 1 came out. And I want to talk to these gentlemen about uh, the, some of the new strats and schemes. We'll be right back. DZ Learguard here, creator of the M3E Crew Builder app. And I'm a patron of Third Floor Wars because supporting great content creators like them is one of the best ways to help grow this game. So to join me and the other floor heads, go to patreon.com and search for Third Floor Wars, and we will see you there. Recently, we broke 100 patrons. I want to thank our most recent patrons, Marcus Moore, Drawnex, Joshua Story, Peter Pot, Sergei Chapovalov, Super Hottie 69, Adam Talbot, and Richie Richmitten. Thank you. So we got um, uh, really a lot changed with Gaining Grounds 1. Um, and uh, if you haven't listened to the episode where I had Matt and Kyle on to talk about Gaining Grounds 1, um, I'll have a link to it in the show notes. It's worth listening to to kind of understand what the thinking was behind it. Um, I'd be curious, though, Ambrose, um, do you have a favorite new strategy? I, I'm going to go back to uh, Corrupted Ley Lines. I think it's it's super fun. Um the gameplay is dynamic. It, it uses up the entire space on the board. So you're interacting with a whole bunch of different spots. Um, I think, you know, I, I mentioned that I'm, I'm changing up my hiring a little bit for that, where I'm hiring Waldgeists more than I, than I was before, where it was mostly knights. Um, I, I'm liking Ruger there. I think that it's, it's shaking up that aspect of it. Um, and it's, I mean, people joke about sports ball and passing the football, but it really does create this dynamic feel of your crew pitching in together to get from one point to the other, pass the stone over here, and now we're scoring over here. Um, it, I, I think that is just, a, it's very different from what we had before, and it's a lot yes. of fun. It is. Well, it's fun, fun playing Guild Ball with Malifo bottles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Matt? Do you have a favorite new strategy? Well, coming from second edition and late second edition, um, I couldn't be happier that they retooled Symbols of Authority and brought yeah. it back. Um, Titania is good at it, not that it is her best, but in general, I think that that, scheme, uh, that strategy is just a ton of fun. The attacker, defender, you really see where keywords shine in their ability to either be aggressors or defenders, you know, who's good at building a castle and who's good about, about getting across the board. And when you get those yep. two different types of crews opposed to each other, you get really cool, really dynamic matches that I believe that that's what they wanted to see in this game. You know? Yeah. I missed, I missed, uh, symbols and I, it's better than it ever was. I mean, I liked it before and I think this is a much, much better version. Um, I'd be curious, Matt, is there anything, any of the strategies you think have a huge impact on crew building? Cause one of the things that I love about Malifaux is that you don't bring the same 10 models to every, to every match, right? That you, that you really do adjust your hiring based off of what the strategies and schemes are of the four um, strategies out there right now, which one do you think has the biggest impact on crew building? It's tough. It's a toss up. Um, recover evidence is big, but, but I have to go back to public enemies. Um, I think that the fact that they've given you a range to pick from, um, as to where those bounty points lie gives you a lot of agency as to, you know, what kind of crew you're going to hire. Um, are you going to maximize, you know, only six and only eight stone models? I'm not going to bring a nine or 10 stone, you know, henchman or enforcer to this crew. I'm just going to live on eights and sixes. Um, yep. That's that's a way to approach it, especially if you can bring tough eight stone and six stone models that that just take time to bring down. Um, it, it, it's it's really going to dictate how people hire, um, and if they're playing right, they're they're going to min max those numbers. Yeah, you you can cap literally. You can cap um, your opponent based off of your crew building. So I completely agree. So Ambrose, what do you miss? Um, is there anything that we lost, um, in gaining grounds one? Is there anything from, uh, gaining ground zero or the original book that, uh, you're like, you know what? I kind of like that. And I miss it a little bit. So everyone's going to hate me, but I miss corrupted idols. <laughs> oh, do you really? <laughs> um, 
I thought Tatani was awesome at it. And, you know, I'm picking up more masters, but she's my favorite. And, uh, uh, I mean, as Neverborn players, we have that ancient pact that can give us the initiative bump. Um, it, it, I so what the thing is is that it it gave us a strategy to to dictate a zone of play. Yep. Um, and uh, we kind of had the tools to do that, and we were one of the only factions that had the tool, the outright tools to just say, "I have plus two initiative. I'm dropping the marker here. We're fighting here. Come and get me." Yeah. Um, and they've, they've brought, you know, they have brought that back with our um, uh, public enemies to an extent. Yeah. And um, the recover evidence, it can be a very come fight me strategy now. Mm-hmm. Um, so we still have that a little bit, but I, I liked tossing those markers back and forth across the line. <laughs> I don't miss it at all. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was very, very happy that that thing went away. Um, but I do understand what you're saying. How about you, Matt? What do you miss? Anything? No, I, I don't miss anything. I was just going to say as a Neverborn uh, player and, and loyalist, um, I thought GG zero was terrible for us. So good riddance. Uh, on to GG1. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully seeing better results from, from the faction overall. Um, I, I think that schemes and strats mean a lot in this game, and it's nice to see that just switching that document up can change the power base maybe a little. We'll see. I mean, yeah. I'm not trying to make any strong declarations, but I already feel like we're in a better place. I think there's a, I think there's an op, uh, we have an opportunity to stop the Neverborn whining. So I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> it's been bad. One, the, only, the only faction that whines more than you guys is Guild. And, and uh, <laughs> actually, I think Guild got a little bit better in gaining grounds one too. So uh, no, I mean, I agree, Matt. I think that there was there was legitimate struggles that Neverborn had as a faction. Um, and though my my experience is limited with gaining grounds one. I think it is for a lot of us uh, that aren't active on vassal um, because of what's happening. Um, it make it does make me happy um, because I, again, if you go back and listen to what Matt and Kyle talked about, that was one of their goals, right? Was to get, get some dust off of some models and, and to see stuff that wasn't getting played being played again because of uh, uh, not because they changed the model, but because they changed the wind conditions, which I think is cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, guys, do either of you have anything you want to plug before we go? Um, I just, you know, you mentioned Vassal, and, and I've been playing there a lot. Um, I think that if you haven't given it a shot, especially where we're at right now, you should consider it. Um, one of the, the organizers there is starting to stream some of the Vassal games. So if you're not sure about, you know, the interface, um, you should be seeing some more more of what that looks like out there on, in the world. Um, so I think, I think it's worth considering. Um, it would be cool to get that sort of global meta to yeah. raise up a little bit. Um, that, that yeah. is cool, man. Vassal's cool. And, and here's the thing about Vassal. Um, the first time you play it, it kind of sucks uh, because it, it's slow. And, you know, if you think it takes, if it takes three hours for you to play a Malifaux game on the table, it's going to take you four hours on Vassal. But the learning curve is not steep. Uh, second game, you get a lot better. The third game, you do a lot better. Uh, 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 Brown and those guys that are running the Vassal stuff and kind of the leaders yep. have done a great job putting resources on their Facebook group. So make sure you join the Facebook group. There's a, a, a Discord channel that should be linked to that Facebook yep well and there's constantly constantly people looking for games yeah it's really cool it's really really cool it allows you to get your reps in which i I preach about all the time and it's and it's a neat it's a neat little sub community um i mean i think malifold players are more helpful than most tabletop uh gaming groups that are out there just for whatever reason we are a uh, a community that's very encouraging and and we like new players and we like to help new players and um I think Vassal's even more so. I mean, uh, you, I see somebody new jump into the Facebook group and say, hey, does anybody want to teach me? And there's like six, seven comments on it. Yep. Saying, yeah, let me know. I'm in Australia. I'm in the UK. Um, I'm on, you know, I'm in the Southeast, whatever. Um, it's pretty impressive. So I'm with you. How about you, Matt? Well, uh, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, um, tournaments have been shut down. And, you know, I'm, I'm a guy who 
played three times a week. You know, I, I played yeah. a lot of Malifaux, so I, I'm definitely missing it. You know, despite my Mortal Kombat addiction um, as well, but. Um, I'm, I'm looking to probably get into Vassal um, and, and start doing that because it's not looking like it's going to let up anytime soon. Not that I can't get a game here or there with certain friends. Um, it's just not three games a week like I'm used to. Yeah. <laughs> so I might suffer some learning curve to get on Vassal just to get some Malifaux in because I need it. Well, and I think the other thing, too, and I'll be interested. I don't know. I dread finding out what's going to happen. I'll be interested at the same time. Um, one of the things that I talk about more than once on the podcast is that um, in order to grow this game, we need to be out there and we need to be playing it. We need people to see it, which means stop playing at home, stop playing in your basement, pick up your models, go to the game store every Tuesday and yep. play in front of people. And, and we're not doing that. Yep. Um, and it, um, you know, we ha- here in uh, the Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina area, we've got three uh, you could argue four uh, really good game stores, um, which is, is is all within five miles, ten miles of each other, which is an excess of riches, really. Um, I think there's uh, areas of this country and of this world that would kill to have just one of the shops that we have. And we have four of them. Um, I will be shocked if there's four when this is over. Yep. Yep. Um, I really will be, which makes me sad. Um, and I worry a lot about a lot of the other game shops out there, man. Um, it, um, it, it's impossible to know what's going to happen. It really, really is. And, uh, it's going to be important for us, um, as tabletop gamers to make sure that when things get closer to normal, that we come out in strength. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that our pent up, uh, love and desire will do that. Um, cause I, you know, I'm, I'm playing role playing games now on roll 20. Right. You know, um, I'm because I'm not going out and playing Malifaux and Marvel Crisis and stuff like that like I was. Um, and it, so it pushed me into a new interest that, that I had let, you know, I hadn't done in 20 years. And, and you know, Matt, you're playing video games again more than you used to. And uh, that's going to be common. What's going to be interesting, though, is do we come back to it? Um, and I, I, my hope is, is that the passion for tabletop gaming is strong enough that we will. But uh, we're going to have to see. I mean, I think the, the saving grace is that the other games aren't playing as well. So at least we're not losing to, you know, the other games that are out there. But um, across the board, we might drop a few. Yeah, and that's another good point. I mean, I talk about game stores, but let's be honest. There's, um, there's some tabletop games out there that we're struggling to begin with um, that were what I consider, you know, the big five or the big six games. Um, and they're not going to come out of this. I'll tell you that right now. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, Games Workshop will. Uh, I have no doubt Weird will. Um, uh, I worry about Privateer Press because um, I know that they were making a big push and hoping to get out this new game, um, this new look and feel for them. Um, and this this crushes that. And the other one I worry about is I worry about uh, Corvus Bell. I mean, they were about to launch into and release a whole new version of Infinity that was you know, specifically designed to bring in new players because uh, I know that their player base has been shrinking. And, you know, who knows when that's going to happen now. Um, But uh, I guess we'll just see. Well, gentlemen, I really appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, I look forward to having you both on again. Um, uh, For those of you that stuck around to the very end, I appreciate you listening. Take care. Be sure to check out our shop on thirdfloorwars.com for the latest gaming apparel and gear. While you're there, check out how the USFO Tour is shaping up. How does your conference compare to the others in the United States? Where do you rank nationally? Get those models built, painted, and on the table so we can see you at the U.S. Masters Invitational in October of 2020. Also, rate and write a review on this podcast for us. It really helps us find people almost as cool as you are. Thanks for listening. Howdy, friend. Craig here. Is this episode making you realize you need to buy some models? Gadzooks Gaming is my favorite online retailer because of their large selection, killer prices, and great customer service. Don't you hate buying an entire crew box when you only need one model? Gadzook sells crew box models individually and saves you a ton of money. They even have free shipping to the U.S. and Canada if you spend $100 or more. Swing by gadzooksgaming.com and make sure you tell them Craig from the third floor sent you. All the details are in the show notes. Howdy folks, Craig here. Now if you love gadgets as much as we do, you're going to love the new Third Floor Wars Gadget Bundle from Schooner Labs. 
Branded with the logo of your favorite podcast, it comes with two measuring multi-tools, a compass stepper for those tight and important movements, along with a compact dashboard to track your turn, strat, and scheme scoring along with your soul stones and pass tokens. It is the perfect bundle for anyone who plays Malifaux or just wants to look cool while doing it. The link is in the show notes. Check them out and help support your favorite gaming podcast. Uh, and, uh, I fucked that up. Trying to figure out where to pick up. Give me a second. I'll figure it out in edits. <laughs> all right hey okay. that's things for yeah. it right. i do appreciate it i gotta go to bed awesome yeah, thank you thank Craig, you for having us right. um so here's what's gonna happen guys look real quick i'm gonna hit stop on the- all right um time wise we're doing pretty good so we'll let's we'll see how this plays out who wants to start this one who wants to talk about their uh, favorite new strategy ambrose <laughs> I'm just going to talk about ley lines again because it's awesome. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that, uh, I, you know, I don't want to, I want to open this up to, to everybody who's playing the game, but I think that the new strats and schemes are just a golden age for Neverborn. I, it was such an overhaul, and there are, you know, my list of schemes I want to take now is so much longer, uh, yes. both for Pacific Masters and the faction as a whole. And I, and I definitely want to talk about it in the context of Neverborn, but I also want to talk about it generally too. So what, I, what I'd be really interested to know is, like, what do you love to play? Like, what what are what is a strategy that you see and go, you know, what, that's just cool. That's yeah. just that's a new way to play Malifaux. Or it, it, it's how I like to play Malifaux. <laughs> um, so okay, good. I'll bring us back. Um, about that whole thing. Um. I had a fucking question. I can't think what the fucking question was. Um, <laughs> I had it in my head. Fuck. Uh, it was a good one, too. Um, right before we went to that other direction. I can't remember. It doesn't matter. Um, all right. Give me a second. I can I can jump off of uh, what Matt was saying about uh, aggressor, defender. Yeah. Uh, yep. Go ahead and start fresh. Yep. Yeah. All right. Who wants to start second level play? I think Ambrose should start second level play, and I'll uh, right. follow okay. him. Then you'll cut. You'll come in and tell me he's wrong. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and I think that uh, in, in when we talked about this before, I was leaning more on the positioning and, and adaptive gameplay, and, and Matt's uh, real big on the the hand management side of things. Good. Yep, yep, definitely. Good, good, good. And night right. play for, for you, I think, was something you brought up early. Was was night yep. play. All right, cool. We'll start with you then, Ambrose. Cool. Nice and efficient, gentlemen. I'm liking it. Absolutely. All right. You're not going to um, like my answer on strategies, so, but I can kind of defend them all. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know what I'm going to like or not like? Right. <laughs> um. All right. Um, so Ambrose, what we typically do in this segment here is we're, I'm not going to go over all four strategies. Mm-hmm. What, what I'm going to do is, um, and I'll st- probably start with Matt. I'm going to uh, have him pick pick one, uh, look to you for maybe a second one. Um, if it turns out that she's good in a third one, uh, that's fine. The one thing I want to make sure that we keep into respect or keep into context is that she's competing against other Neverborn Masters. Right. So, um, yeah, she might be able to handle she might be a good all comers, but does that mean she's the best in every pool? Probably not. So uh, let's make sure we keep in mind that uh, she's one of several never born choices. So. All right. And we do have Dreamer, the best master in the game. So. Oh, good Lord. He's still he's, he's still. God, I fucking hate that guy. I, I think I'm I, Matt and I have talked about the stitch together, and they might actually be better now. <laughs> I, I, I really don't want to talk about that. But, um, <laughs> here's what pisses me off about Dreamer. What pisses me off about Dreamer is he's cool as shit, right? Yeah. So not only not only do I hate him, but I like I, I'm like, oh god, he's so cool. Like he's so cool to lose to. Like I mean, it's just it's a great crew. It's yeah, a great. I was crew. thinking about it. I was like, you know. 
he would be a good contender to rotate out in a dead man's hand into dead man's hand, but they're never going to be do getting that. Never going to do it because he's too cool. He pulls too many new players in. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you said it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I'll bring us back, and uh, Matt, we'll start with you um, with what's what strategy you really like her in. All right, nice done, nicely done. Thanks, man. Definitely. So we definitely have to bring up into Thorns, um, w- which will be def- will be part of the crew because most of the crew has that trigger. But that is also a big deal with Titania is uh, that plus one damage on a two, four, five yep. with a crow and, and placing them. I think uh, that that's definitely something we got to get at. Yeah, and, and we'll do. You can do it just as a callback. Um, okay. So uh, just you know, when, when you bring up another model that has it, mention that Titania has it um, okay. and how how it fits there. So that's good. Awesome. Um. All right, Ambrose. We'll start with you. We'll talk about um, the totem, and then your first hire after the totem. Sure. All right. Sounds good. I'll bring us back. <laughs> 